Chapter 25, Quest for Consensus, 1952 to 1960. Individual Choices, Alan Freed. It was an easy choice. As host of a classical music program for WJW Radio in Cleveland, Ohio, Alan Freed had few listeners and fewer opportunities. His fortune changed in the summer of 1951 when Leo Mintz presented Freed with a unique possibility. Mintz, a record store owner, had noticed the rhythm and blues R&B records were selling very well and not just to African Americans. To sell more records, he offered to sponsor a late night program of R&B music on WJW with Freed as host. Freed's acceptance began a mercurial career that brought fame and fortune before plunging him to earth in a fiery crash. His new gig, The Moondog Show, reached out to all the moondog daddies and crazy kittens while he rang cowbells, made pounding noises, and yelled into the microphone. To traditional listeners, it was anarchy, but to teens living in Ohio and neighboring states, it was pure excitement. Realizing the profits in R&B, Freed sponsored live, sponsored live concerts, filling theaters, halls, and armories with screaming teens. As the music's popularity grew, so too did Freed's. Soon as radio programs were being rebroadcast in larger markets, including New York City. In 1954, the King of the Moondoggers left Cleveland for New York City and WINS. No longer able to use the term Moondog after losing a copyright suit, Freed renamed his program Rock and Roll Party. Within months, he had the number one show in the New York market, and the term rock and roll was linked to a new music genre. In 1956, Freed starred with Bill Haley and his Comets and the Platters in Rock Around the Clock, the first rock and roll movie targeting teens, which grossed $2.4 million. By 1957, Freed was hosting a nationally broadcast television show on ABC featuring teens dancing to rock and roll. See this chapter's individual voices feature. Although rock and roll had a large number of detractors, Fred was tapping an emerging teen market estimated to spend $75 million a year on records. As the market increased, the R&B slash rock and roll music industry exploded with independent record labels signing a variety of new singers and producing hundreds of records a month. For record producers, the road to success was the radio. When Freed first played Crying in the Chapel, 30,000 copies of the record sold the next day. Providing scientific proof, a study found it took only five to six radio exposures to jumpstart sales of a record. With profits at stake, record companies offered gifts and monetary incentives to disc jockeys and radio stations to play their records, a long-standing technique called payola. Freed, like most disc jockeys and radio stations, was deeply involved. By the late 1950s, those concerned about corruption in the music industry and opponents of rock and roll targeted DJs and radio stations for taking bribes and brainwashing the nation's youth. Congressional and internal revenue service investigations and state level prosecutions followed. Freed became the focus of all three. In November 1959, when he refused to sign an affidavit verifying that he had never taken payola, he was dismissed from his radio and television programs. Facing the press outside the station, he announced that payola may stink, but it's here and I didn't start it, and that there was nothing wrong with receiving gifts or getting paid for promoting a song. Later, Freed pled guilty to 29 cases of payola. He died penniless in 1965, shortly after the IRS claimed he owed more than $36,000 in taxes on unreported income. Although Freed disappeared from the public scene, the success of rock and roll would continue to confound its detractors. A detractor, by the way, is a critic, somebody who complains about something. Most observers expected the Republicans to regain the White House in 1952 and to roll back the New Deal and to forcefully confront communism abroad. They got less than expected. Recognizing that most New Deal style programs were ingrained in society, Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower knew that he could modify but not dismantle them. While he was able to cut spending and reduce regulations, he also expanded the government's role into new areas. In foreign policy, Eisenhower stressed the use of nuclear weapons, alliances, and covert activities, thus maintaining his new look strategy of containment while saving money. He's going to cut back on ordinary or conventional troops and munitions and things. He really is going to emphasize nuclear deterrence, not only as a really practical way to fight the Cold War, but also a really cost-effective way to fight the Cold War. Americans also expected to enjoy the benefits of a growing economy. The focus of life centered on the suburban nuclear family, dot at work, mom at home, nurturing baby boom children. Between child and adult, teenagers generated their own culture, merging consumerism, conformity, and rebelliousness as reflected in the growing popularity of rock and roll. Optimists projected that most Americans had the chance to share in the American dream, even those not living in the suburbs. They promoted the image of consensus or agreement about the meaning and values of America. But the reality was different. Stresses existed within suburbia, and race, gender, poverty, and prejudice kept many from fulfilling their hopes. But change seemed possible as groups formed grassroots organizations to advocate equality and access to a better life. Throughout the South, African Americans, supported by Supreme Court decisions, began to batter down the walls of legal segregation. Increasingly, politics and society found it hard to ignore long-standing contradictions in the country's democratic image. Politics of consensus. Considering the questions, what were the popular images of Eisenhower and how did they compare with reality? What constraints did Eisenhower face in trying to roll back New Deal programs? And how did Eisenhower alter the federal government? Time for a change, cried Republicans in 1952. Politically wounded by the lingering war in Korea and the soft on communism label, the Democrats' 20-year hold on the White House was in jeopardy. Bypassing would-be presidential candidate Senator Robert Taft, moderate Republicans turned to General Dwight David Eisenhower, 
Although politically inexperienced, Ike was well known, revered as a war hero, and carried the image of an honest man thrust into public service. Skillfully gaining the nomination at the Republican convention, Eisenhower chose Richard M. Nixon of California as his vice presidential running mate. Nixon was young and had risen rapidly in the party because of his outspoken anti-communism. The Democrats nominated Adlai E. Stevenson, a liberal New Dealer and governor of Illinois. Eisenhower takes command. The Republican campaign took two paths. One concentrated on the popular image of Eisenhower and used spot commercials on television that stressed his honesty, integrity, and Americanness. Eisenhower crusaded for high standards and good government and posed as another George Washington. A war-weary nation applauded his promise to go to Korea in the cause of peace. McCarthy, Nixon, and others took the second path, brutally attacking the Democrats as Cold War and New Deal records, blasting the Democrats as representing plunder at home and blunder abroad. They boasted that no communists in the Republican Party, or they boasted of, excuse me, no communists in the Republican Party, promised to roll back communism and vowed to dismantle the New Deal. Stevenson's effort to talk sense to the voters stood little chance. Eisenhower buried Stevenson in popular and electoral votes, and his broad political coattails also swept Republican majorities into Congress. Republicans also won in four southern states, breaking the Democratic solid South for the first time. Four years later, the 1956 presidential election was a repeat of 1952, with Eisenhower receiving 457 electoral votes, including those from seven southern states, and again swamping Stevenson. But in 1956, the Republican victory was Eisenhower's alone, as Democrats managed to maintain the majorities in both houses of Congress that they had won in the 1954 midterm um, races. During both of his administrations, Eisenhower was Ike to the public. I like Ike, a warm, friendly, grandfather figure who projected middle-class values and habits. Critics complained that he seemed almost an absentee president, often leaving the government in the hands of Congress and his cabinet while he played golf or bridge. But to those who knew and worked with him, he was far from bumbling or neglectful. In military fashion, Eisenhower relied on his staff to provide a full discussion of any issue. We had a good growl, he would say after especially heated cabinet talks, but he made the final decisions and he expected them to be carried out. And historians have gone back and revamped his image and seen how he really did act behind the scenes and he really was an active president more than his political image might have suggested at the time. Dynamic conservatism. Eisenhower wanted to follow a middle course that was conservative when it comes to money and liberal when it comes to human beings. He believed that government should be run efficiently like a successful business and he staffed his cabinet with a majority of businessmen, most of whom were millionaires. Among the president's key priorities was to reduce spending in the presence of the federal government. Yet, like Truman, Eisenhower recognized the politics of the practical, and he understood that many New Deal agencies and functions would, uh, could not be attacked. He told his brother that any political party that tried to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs would not be heard of again. To balance the budget, Eisenhower used a meat axe on Truman's projected budgets. budgets. He dismissed 200,000 government workers, cut domestic spending by 10%, and slashed the military budget. He and Republicans in Congress also sought to trim spending and federal responsibilities by reducing the federal government's role in the areas of energy, the environment, and trusteeship over Indian reservations. Advocating private ownership and state responsibility, he signed legislation allowing private ownership of nuclear power plants and reducing federal control over the industry, placing much of the nation's offshore oil sources under state authority, and opening federal lands to lumber and mining companies. Eisenhower also approved legislation in 1954 that began to withdraw federal services and economic support to Native American tribes, encouraged Indians to leave the reservations, and liquidated tribal lands and resources. The Klamath tribe in Oregon, for example, sold much of their Ponderosa pine lands to lumber companies. Critics blasted Eisenhower for his termination policy as an attack on American Indian culture and society. Before the policy was reversed in the 1960s, 61 tribes were involved. Some experienced short-term economic gains with the sale of land and resources, but long-term benefits failed to materialize. Reservations were poorer, and the nearly half of reservation Indians who had abandoned their reservations and moved to urban areas found that few jobs or opportunities were available. Recognizing political reality, Eisenhower stood by as Congress increased agricultural subsidies, the minimum wage to $1 an hour, funds for urban development, and Social Security benefits, but he also expanded the role of government in new directions. In 1953, he created the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, although he believed that public health was best left to states and communities. In 1955, Jonas Salk developed a vaccine against polio, a disease affecting the central nervous system that in 1952 had infected 52,000 people, mostly children. Many called for a nationwide federal program to inoculate children against the disease. The administration, supported by the American Medical Association, rejected that idea as too socialistic and relied on state and local vaccination programs to immunize the public. There were also two new major government spending programs, the St. Lawrence Seaway Act 1954 and the Federal Highway Act 1956. The first, the Seaway Act, funded the joint U.S.-Canadian construction of an inland waterway connecting the Great Lakes with the Atlantic. 
The second, the Federal Highway Act, provided funding to construct the initial 41,000 miles of an interstate highway system. In justifying this program, the administration maintained that the military needed a modern road system to effectively deploy its forces in case of war. In 1957, Eisenhower again extended federal spending after the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2 into space. Not only did the nation seem vulnerable to Soviet missiles, but it appeared that the American education system was not putting enough effort into teaching mathematics and science. Eisenhower promptly asked Congress to provide money for public education and to create a new agency to coordinate the country's space program. The National Defense Education Act of 1958 provided funding for public education to improve the teaching of math, languages, and science, and it set aside $295 million in national defense student loans for college students. To improve the space program, Congress created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, which unveiled Project Mercury with the goal of sending astronauts into space. The problem with McCarthy. With the Democrats defeated, Eisenhower and most Republicans hoped McCarthy would fade away. Instead, he continued to search for people who he could label subversive and try to, criti and to criticize foreign policy. When, in 1954, McCarthy claimed favoritism toward known communists in the army, anti-McCarthy forces in Congress, quietly supported by Eisenhower, moved to defang the senator and established a committee to examine his claims. The American Broadcasting Company's telecast of the 1954 Army McCarthy hearings allowed more than 20 million television viewers to see McCarthy's ruthless bullying firsthand. When the Army's lawyer, Joseph Welch, asked the brooding McCarthy, have you no sense of decency, the nation burst into applause. McCarthy's power ebbed, and several months later, the Senate voted 67 to 22 to censure his unbecoming conduct, meaning he's no longer allowed to really speak or participate a whole lot in the Senate. Drinking heavily, shunned by his colleagues, and ignored by the media, McCarthy died of alcoholism in 1957. Eisenhower and World Affairs, considering the, the two questions, what were the weaknesses of the new look and how did Eisenhower address them, and what tactics did the Eisenhower administration pursue in the Third World, especially in the Middle East and Latin America, to protect American interests? During the 1952 campaign, Eisenhower promised to go to Korea to bring the war to an honorable end. After his election, the president kept his promise, and after a three-day visit, he concluded that a negotiated peace was the only solution. To prod the North Koreans and the Chinese to sign a Korean truce agreement, Eisenhower used public and private channels to suggest that the U.S. might use atomic weapons. By July of 1953, the strategy apparently had worked. A truce signed at Panmunjom ended the fighting and brought home almost all of the troops, but it left Korea divided by a demilitarized zone. Had the nuclear threat atomic diplomacy worked? Some thought it had, but in reality, it was Stalin's death in March of 1953 that allowed the North Koreans and the Chinese to accept resolution of key issues that had been deadlocked in the talks. The New Look. Eisenhower was well qualified to lead American foreign policy, having spent years in the military and as a commander of NATO. He understood the purpose of campaign slogans like liberation and rollback, but he also knew that the U.S. could not afford to maintain its current level of military spending if the budget was to be balanced. The key was to find a policy that matched both the nation's needs and its capabilities. His approach was called the New Look. At the New Look's core was nuclear deterrence, an enhanced arsenal of nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and the threat of massive retaliation. To strengthen the policy's deterrent capability, the administration intensified efforts to develop an intercontinental and intermediate range ballistic missile system that could launch warheads from land bases and from submarines, and it introduced a new jet powered bomber fleet of B 47s. Rather than let the communists nibble us to death all over the world in little wars, Vice President Nixon explained, we will rely on massive mobile retaliation. Secretary of Defense Charles E. Wilson, noting that the nuclear strategy was cheaper than conventional forces, quipped that the policy ensured more bang for the buck. Demonstrating the country's nuclear might, the U.S. exploded its first hydrogen bomb in November of 1952. The Soviets tested their first one in August of 1953. Uh, let's see. They also expanded our arsenal of strategic nuclear, nuclear weapons to 6,000 and developed tactical nuclear weapons of a lower destructive power that could be used on the battlefield. It was necessary to remove the taboo from using nuclear weapons, Secretary of State John Foster Doles informed the press. The new look was sold to the public as more positive than Truman's defense containment policy, but insiders recognized that it had flaws. The central problem was where the U.S. should draw the massive retaliation line. What if the enemy calls our bluff? How do you convince the American people and the U.S. Congress to declare war? Asked one planner. The answer was to convince potential aggressors that the U.S. would strike back, re uh, raining nuclear destruction not only on the attackers, but also on the Soviets and Chinese so that the bluff would never be called. This policy was called brinkmanship because it required the administration to take the nation to the brink of war, trusting that the opposition would back down. To strengthen the idea of going nuclear and make the possibility of World War III less frightening, the administration stressed that nuclear war was survivable. Public and private underground fallout shelters, well stocked with food, water, and medical supplies could, it was claimed, provide safety against an attack. A 32-inch uh, inch thick slab of concrete, U.S. News & World Report related, could protect people from an atomic blast as close as 1,000 feet away. 
Across the nation, civil defense drills were established for factories, offices, and businesses. Duck and cover drills were held in schools. When their teachers shot a drop, students immediately got into kneeling or prone positions and placed their hands behind their necks. While people were being convinced that nuclear war was survivable, movies and novels showed the possible horrors of radiation and nuclear destruction. Neville Shute portrayed the extinction of humankind in his novel On the Beach, 1957. In Godzilla, 1954, and dozens of other B-movies, hideous nuclear mutated monsters, people, and other creatures wreaked havoc and threatened the world. Understanding the limits of American power and that a thermonuclear war would yield no winners, Eisenhower found other ways to promote American power and influence, including an increased use of alliances and covert operations. Alliances would identify areas protected by the American nuclear umbrella and would protect the U.S. from being drawn into limited brush fire wars. When small conflicts erupted, the ground forces of regional allies, perhaps supported with American uh, naval and air strength, would snuff them out. In Asia, Eisenhower concluded bilateral defense pacts with South Korea, 1953, and Taiwan, 1955, and a multilateral agreement, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CEDAW, in 1954, that linked the U.S., Australia, Thailand, the Philippines, Pakistan, New Zealand, France, and Britain. In the Middle East, the U.S. officially joined Britain, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, and Iraq in the Baghdad Pact in 1957, later called the Central Treaty Organization, CENTO, after Iraq withdrew in 1959. In Europe, the U.S. approved the rearming of West Germany in 1954 and welcomed it into NATO in 1958. In all, the Eisenhower administration signed 43 pacts to help defend regions or individual countries from communist aggression. The Third World in 1946, 51 nations, most located in Europe and the Western Hemisphere, signed the United Nations Charter. During the next 10 years, 25 more nations entered, about a third of them having achieved independence from European nations through revolution and political and social protests. By 1960, 37 new nations existed in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. For many of the emerging nations, independence did not bring prosperity or stability, and the so-called Third World became part of the Cold War. Both the West and the Communist bloc competed for the hearts and minds of the emerging nations. Commenting on nationalistic movements in Latin America, Dulles said, in the old days, we used to be able to let South America go through the ringer of bad times, but the trouble is, now when you put it through the ringer, it comes out red, meaning that it comes out communist. One solution to the problem was to use economic and military aid, political pressure, and the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA, to support governments that were anti-communist and to provide stability, even if that stability was achieved through ruthless and undemocratic means. It seemed a never-ending and largely thankless task. While we are busy rescuing Guatemala or assisting Korea and Indochina, Eisenhower observed, the communists make great inroads in Burma, Afghanistan, and Egypt. To meet the growing need, the CIA expanded by 500% and shifted its resources to covert activities, 80% by 1957. In its conduct of activities, the CIA, headed by Alan Dulles, operated with almost no congressional oversight or restrictions, meaning they're acting largely in secret without the blessing of other uh, branches or actors within the government. Turmoil in the Middle East. In the Middle East, Arab nationalism, fired by anti-Israeli and anti-Western attitudes, posed a serious threat to American interests. Iran and Egypt offered the greatest challenges. In Iran, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh had nationalized British-owned oil properties and seemed likely to sell oil to the Soviets. Eisenhower considered him to be neurotic and periodically unstable and gave the CIA the green light to overthrow the Iranian leader and replace him with a pro-Western government. On August 18, 1953, Mossadegh was forced from office and was replaced with Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who awarded the U.S. 40% of Iranian oil production. Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser, who assumed power in 1954, posed a similar problem. At first, the U.S. saw Nasser as a stabilizing influence and provided money to help build the Aswan Dam on the Nile. But the U.S. attitude changed when Nasser's relations with Israel deteriorated and he purchased arms from the Soviet bloc. Calling him an evil influence, Eisenhower canceled the Aswan Dam project in July of 56. Days later, claiming the need to finance the dam, Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, meaning that he placed it under the control of the national government, um, the Egyptian government, removing control from outside businesses. Israel, France, and Britain responded with military action to regain control of the canal. Eisenhower was furious. He disliked Nasser, but he could not approve armed aggression. Fearful of Soviet intervention, Eisenhower quickly sponsored a UN General Assembly resolution calling for an end to the fighting, the removal of foreign troops from Egyptian soil, and the assignment of a UN peacekeeping force there. Faced with worldwide opposition and intense pressure from the US, including a threat to withhold oil shipments, France, Britain, and Israel withdrew their forces. Nasser regained control of the canal and, as Eisenhower had feared, emerged a major leader in the Arab world willing to accept Soviet support. 
The growth of Nasser's and the Soviets' influence in the Middle East forced Eisenhower to ask Congress for permission to commit American forces, if requested, to resist armed attack from any country controlled by internationalism. By internationalism, Eisenhower meant the forces of communism. Congress agreed in March of 57, establishing the so-called Eisenhower Doctrine and providing $200 million in military and economic aid to improve military defenses in the nations of the Middle East. Eisenhower soon applied his doctrine when an internal revolt threatened Jordan's King Hussein in 57. The White House announced that Jordan was vital to American interests, moved the U.S. 6th Fleet in, uh, into the Eastern Mediterranean, and supplied more than $10 million in aid. King Hussein put down the revolt, dismissed parliament and all political parties, and instituted authoritarian rule. A year later, when Lebanon's Christian president, Camille Shamoun, faced an uprising of Muslim nationalistic and anti-West elements, Eisenhower committed nearly 15,000 troops to protect the pro-American government. Within three months, Washington, without firing a shot, oversaw the formation of a new government and withdrew American forces. A protective neighbor. During the 1952 presidential campaign, Eisenhower charged Truman with following a poor neighbor policy toward Latin America, allowing the development of economic problems and popular uprisings that had been skillfully exploited by the communists. He was most concerned about Guatemala's president, Jacobo Arbenz, who appeared to have communist leanings and had instituted agrarian reforms by nationalizing thousands of acres of land, much of it owned by the American-based uh, American United Fruit Company. The administration ordered the CIA to organize and to supply a rebel army led by Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas, which invaded Guatemala on June 18, 1954. Within weeks, a new pro-American government was installed in Guatemala City. Speaking after Arbenz had fled, Secretary of State Doles announced the peoples of Guatemala had cured the problem by themselves. But social and economic inequalities continued and the action did not foster goodwill toward the United States. The next crisis occurred closer to home when a rebellion led by Fidel Castro toppled the Cuban government of Fulgencio Batista, who had held power throughout most of the 40s and 50s. The corrupt and dictatorial Batista had become an embarrassment to the US and many Americans believed that Castro could be a pro-American reformist leader. By 1959, however, with Castro's forces in control of the island, many in Washington were concerned about Castro's economic and social reforms, which endangered American investments and interests. Washington's response was to apply economic and political pressure. In February 1960, Castro reacted by signing an economic pact with the Soviet Union. Eisenhower seethed. Castro was a madman, going wild and harming the whole American structure. In March, Eisenhower approved a CIA plan to overthrow the Cuban leader. Actual implementation of the plot, however, fell to Eisenhower's successor, which was JFK. The new look in Asia. Korea was not the only problem in Asia that Eisenhower faced when he took office. Chinese threats continued toward Taiwan and its offshore islands, and a war of national liberation raged in French Indochina. In both cases, Eisenhower continued Truman's policies, supporting the nationalistic Chinese and the French. By 54, the struggle between France and the Viet Minh was not going well for Paris. Watching the French military position worsen, Eisenhower announced the domino theory, warning that if Indochina fell to communism, the loss of Burma, of Thailand, of the Malay Peninsula, and Indonesia would certainly follow, endangering Australia and New Zealand. To many, it meant that the United States needed to take a more direct role in the conflict, and it's worth noting that this idea that if one country falls to communism, then another one is more likely to fall. Eisenhower is not the first one to say this. Um, even Truman you know, references this with the Truman Doctrine um, when he wants to provide aid to Greece and Turkey. As Viet Minh forces launched murderous attacks on the beleaguered French fortifications at Dien Bien Phu, the French and some members of the Eisenhower administration wanted American intervention to save the garrison. Eisenhower rejected the idea, saying that no military victory was possible in that kind of theater. The surrender of Dien Bien Phu on May 7, 1954 forced the French to negotiate an end to their control over Indochina. The Geneva Agreement created three new nations out of French Indochina, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Vietnam was temporarily partitioned along the 17th parallel, but within two years, elections were to be held to unify the nation. The three new nations were not to enter into military alliances or allow foreign bases on their territory. American strategists called the settlement a disaster. Half of Vietnam was lost to communism and elections were likely to favor the communists. The US therefore refused to sign the agreement and Eisenhower immediately moved to support South Vietnam's new government and prime minister, Ngo Dinh Diem. With American blessings, Diem ignored the Geneva-mandated unification elections, quashed his political opposition, and in October of 55, staged a plebiscite that created the Republic of Vietnam and elected him president. In the wider world, the Great Leap Forward. Concerned about the slow pace of Chinese economic growth, Mao Zedong began the Great Leap Forward in 1958 to mobilize the masses. Within a year, 700 million people were placed in more than 25,500 communes that served as centers of labor and production. Focused on grain and steel, goals were lofty, such as surpassing Britain as an industrial power in 15 years. To expand steel production, backyard steel furnaces were constructed in villages, communes, and schools. 
Most of China's forests were destroyed to supply wood for the furnaces. From the communes, workers marched to work on farms and in factories and to build massive public works projects like flood controls on the Yellow River. Despite claims of staggering production success, the Great Leap Forward was an economic disaster that, combined with bad weather, resulted in three hard years, 1959 to 62, of widespread starvation that claimed over 30 million victims. Again, that number is 30 million victims. For Americans, it is further proof that the communist system was seriously flawed and dangerous. The Soviets and Cold War Politics. Stalin's death in 1953 not only helped to resolve the Korean War, but also offered an opportunity to improve American-Soviet relations. When the new Russian president, Georgi Malenkov, called for peaceful coexistence, Eisenhower asked the Soviets to demonstrate their willingness to cooperate with the West. Although deep-seated suspicions remained and both the U.S. and the Soviets continued to test their hydrogen bombs, there was a thawing of the Cold War, and in 1955, Eisenhower agreed to a summit meeting in Geneva with the new Soviet leadership team of Nikolai Bolganin and Nikita Khrushchev, who had replaced Malenkov. Eisenhower expected no resolution on major issues, but decided to propose a bold disarmament initiative, the Open Skies Proposal. He suggested that the U.S. and the Soviets share information about military installations and permit aerial reconnaissance to verify the information while also beginning to work on general disarmament. Bulganin voiced official interest, but Khrushchev considered the proposal a very transparent espionage device. The Geneva summit ended with each side agreeing to disagree and publicly saying that the spirit of Geneva reduced east-west tensions. The spirit of Geneva vanished when Soviet forces invaded Hungary in November 1956 to quell an anti-Soviet revolt. Many Americans favored supporting the Hungarian freedom fighters, but seeing no way to send aid to the Hungarians without risking all that war, the administration only watched as the Soviets crushed the revolt. Soviet-American relations cooled and Eisenhower and Khrushchev just jousted with each other over nuclear testing, disarmament, and Germany and Berlin. Then in 1958, the simmering issue of Berlin erupted. When the Soviets stated that Berlin was to be unified under East German control, Eisenhower, joined by the British and French, declared that their forces would remain in West Berlin. Faced with unflinching Western determination, Khrushchev backed down and suggested that he and Eisenhower exchange visits and hold a summit meeting. East-West relations seemed to improve as Khrushchev took a 12-day tour of the U.S. in September of 1959, and the two leaders met at a summit in Paris in, 19, in May of 1960. But a thaw in the Cold War failed to materialize. Just as the summit in Paris began, the Soviets shot down an American U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union and captured its pilot. At first, the U.S. claimed the U-2 was a stray weather plane, but the Soviets' display of the captured pilot and pictures of the plane's wreckage clearly proved otherwise. The pilot, for example, had a hypodermic needle filled with poison. Um, you don't need that if you're a weather plane. However, if you're a spy who's facing potential you know, interrogation or torture, something like that might make sense to have. So things like that, it really shows us to be a liar on the world stage. In Paris, Eisenhower took full responsibility but refused to apologize for such flights, which he contended were necessary to prevent a nuclear Pearl Harbor. Khrushchev withdrew from the summit and Eisenhower canceled his forthcoming trip to the Soviet Union. Eisenhower remained popular, but with the loss of the U-2, Soviet advances in missile technology and nuclear weaponry, and a communist Cuba only 90 miles away from Florida, Democrats turned the Republicans' tactics of 1952 against them. In 1960, Democrats cheerfully accused their opponents of endangering the United States by being too soft on communism. The best of times, considering the questions, what new economic factors contributed to prosperity in the 1950s? What stresses and contradictions were at work beneath the placid surface of suburbia? Who voiced criticism and how did they express it? And why were rock and roll and rebellious teens seen as threats to social norms? According to the popular magazine Reader's Digest, in 1954, the average American male stood five feet, nine inches tall and weighed 158 pounds. He liked brunettes, baseball, bowling, and steak and French fries. In seeking a wife, he could not decide if brains or beauty was more important, but he definitely wanted a wife who could run a home efficiently. The average female was five foot four inches tall and weighed 132 pounds. She preferred marriage to career, but she wanted to remove the word obey from her marriage vows. Both man and woman were enjoying life to the fullest, according to the Digest, and buying more of just about everything. The economy appeared to be bursting at the seams, providing jobs, good wages, a multitude of products, and profits. The Web of Prosperity the expanding economy was a result of big government, big business, cheap energy, and an expanding population. World War II and the Cold War had created military industrial governmental linkages that primed the economy through government spending, what some have labeled military Keynesianism. By 1955, national security needs accounted for half of the U.S. budget, equaling about 17% of the gross national product, or GNP, and exceeded the total net incomes of all American corporations. The connection between government and business went beyond direct spending. Millions of research and development dollars flowed into colleges and industries. 
The electronics industry drew 70% of its research money from the government, producing not only new scientific and military technology, but marketable consumer goods from vinyl floors and formica countertops to transistor radios and color televisions. By 1960, the electronics industry was the fifth largest in the nation. In addition, a revolving door seemed to connect government and business positions. Few saw any real conflict of interest, even when those from businesses to be regulated staffed regulatory agencies and cabinet positions and relaxed antitrust activity. Secretary of Defense Wilson, the ex-president of General Motors, later voiced the common view. What was good for our country was good for General Motors and vice versa. It was an era of new economics where, according to the Advertising Council, people's capitalism was creating the highest standard of living ever known by any people at any time. Not all agreed that the connections between government and business were without risk. In his farewell address, President Eisenhower warned of the power of the military industrial complex and its potential threat to the democratic process. And that's a really important thing to note. A push might ask about that. Again, in his farewell address, Eisenhower warned of the military industrial complex. However, few Americans seemed worried when corporate profits doubled between 1948 and 1958 and industrial wages steadily rose from about $55 to $80 a week. Nor was there much concern about corporations getting bigger. Throughout the 1950s, over 4,000 mergers occurred. Large corporations swallowed smaller companies and merged with one another to create conglomerates. International Telephone and Telegraph, for example, acquired construction and insurance firms, food companies, hotels, and other companies not associated with communications. By the end of the decade, 5% of American companies were producing 90% of corporate income, and GNP had doubled since 1940. The new economy also promoted changes in the workforce. Industrial jobs declined even as salaries increased. Some of the decline resulted from increased productivity caused by larger, more efficient plants that increasingly used machines and automation. Another side of the decline, however, was the growth of service and consumer-related jobs. By the mid-1950s, more white-collar jobs existed than blue-collar ones, and union membership continued to decline from wartime highs. Organized labor responded by merging the CIO and the AFL in 1956, avoiding strikes, and focusing on better wages, cost of living raises, and pensions and health benefits. Central to the new economy were the automobile and the industries and jobs that the car had generated. By 1960, 75% of all Americans had at least one car and were driving millions of miles, stopping at newly constructed motels, amusement parks, shopping malls, drive-in theaters, and fast food restaurants. The $32 billion ad allocated to build an interstate highway system was only a fraction of the funding spent on road construction by all levels of government. New and better highways led to more cars, and more cars needed still more roads, parking lots, and places to visit. Disneyland opened in 1955 with acres of parking lots to accommodate the family cars of those who entered the happiest place on earth. Within six months, a million people had visited the Magic Kingdom. A year earlier, Ray Kroc had opened the first McDonald's drive-to restaurant. Within four years, the chain had opened 738 locations, changed the nation's eating habits, and become an American icon. Suburban culture and consumerism. The suburban housing boom continued to spark the economy and, like the automobile, to shape the American landscape. We were thrilled to death, recalled one newly arrived suburbanite. Everybody was arriving with a sense of forward momentum. Everyone was taking courage from the sight of another or another orange moving van pulling up next door, a family just like us, unloading pole lamps and cribs and formica dining tables like our own. Many of the families were moving into the new ranch or California style homes designed to match the most modern family's needs. This was a single story rectangular or L-shaped house with a simple floor plan, an attached garage, and a family room, sometimes complete with a television, now the focus of the house. Near the family room was the modern kitchen with its new appliances, including a refrigerator with a larger freezer to accommodate the growing number of, of frozen foods and TV dinners that made life easier for stay-at-home housewives. At the heart of the home was the American nuclear family. Families were considered the strength of the nation, and the number of families continued to grow, with the baby boom peaking of 4.3 million births in 1957. Within the family, there were clearly defined and idealized roles. Husbands were the breadwinners and directed weekend events. Wives managed the home, cared for the children, and deferred to their husbands' decisions. There was this pressure to be the perfect housekeeper, remembered one suburban wife. For guidance on how to raise babies and children, millions of Americans turned to Dr. Benjamin Spock's popular book, Baby and Child Care, 1946. A mother's love and positive parental guidance were keys to healthy and well-adjusted children. Strict rules and corporal punishment were to be avoided. To ensure proper gender identity, boys should participate in sports and outdoor activities, whereas girls should concentrate on their appearance and domestic skills. Toy guns and doctor bags were for boys, dolls, tea sets, and nurse kits were for girls. Conforming, being part of the group, was as important for parents as for children. Those who didn't fulfill those roles were suspected of being homosexual, immature, or simply irresponsible. Television helped define suburban life. 
Televisions were not widely available until after the war, and then they were very expensive. But as prices fell, the number of homes with a television rocketed from about 9% in 1950 to nearly 90% by the end of the decade. At the same time, programming developed audience-oriented time slots with cartoons and westerns for children on weekend mornings and spots for dad on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. The most watched time slot, however, was the after dinner or was after dinner and designed for family viewing. By 1960, most people watched television five hours a day. Among the most popular shows during the family time slot were situation comedies, sitcoms like Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver. These depicted normal middle class families that were white with hardworking fathers and attractive stay at home mothers. The children, usually numbering between two and four, did well in school, rarely worried about the future, and provided humorous dilemmas for mom to untangle with common sense and sensitivity. After the dislocations of the Depression and the war, stable households seemed to represent the strength and future of the country. I'm going to skip over now and read a deeper understanding of history, television, pictures, and the American family. An advertiser's goal is to convince people to buy a product. To achieve this, the most effective ads not only tout the benefits of the product, but also try to connect it to the desires, concerns, and interests of those who are looking at the ad. When historians look at past advertisements, they are less concerned with particular products than with determining how the ads reflect what people were like during that time and that place. How do ads connect to the popular culture and values of that society, for example, the vision of America in the 1950s? Here, a family is watching the newest home technology, the television. In the 1950s, nothing was newer and becoming more popular and necessary than the television. In 1948, only 350,000 television sets were in use, but within five years, over, over 25 million sets were being watched. Nearly half of American families owned one. So beyond competing for sales, what does this 1951 ad say about the home, the family, and the values of the period? The TV is prominently positioned as a focal point of the room. Is the television becoming the center of family activities, the new hearth? The room itself is quite well furnished and modern, very likely one of the new suburban tract homes being built across the country, like a Levittown. What of the family? It is clearly a well-dressed white family, the typical middle-class American family living the American dream in a suburban home. It is an extended family with three generations watching television, grandparents, parents, and children, a family brought together by the new technology of television. What does the ad suggest about the wife in the picture? Is she standing behind her husband for a reason? Is she reflecting a vision of gender roles, enjoying the company of her family, but poised to move if some household need arises? By examining, examining the ad in its historical context, it is possible to see that in, in addition to touting the product, the ad reflects a nation that is re-embracing the ideal of the traditional family as a center of social harmony and stability after two decades of social crises, depression, and war. It is suggesting that achieving the American dream or part of it is possible and that the TV is part of that dream. It demonstrates how the new consumer world can contribute to a return to normalcy. In short, it is bridging the gap between the new and the nostalgic past. Part of the family's strength and stability, many argued, came from religious faith. The family that prays together stays together announced the Advertising Council. Church attendance reached a historic high of 59.5% in 1953, and that did not include those who attended religious revivals or listened to religious radio and television programs. Religious leaders like the Reverend Norman Vincent Peale and Billy Graham were commonly rated as the most important members of society. Peale's message of Christian positive thinking as a means to improve both the individual and society found a wide audience. More conservative evangelists like Graham questioned society's materialism and stressed a higher level of personal morality. While their views on religion and the problems facing America differed, religious leaders were unanimous on the need to promote faith to prevent the spread of communism. In keeping with the spirit of the times, Congress added under God to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954 and in God we trust to the American currency in 1955. Another dimension of the economy and suburbia was consumerism. Radio and TV bombarded their audiences with images of products that Americans supposedly needed. The average TV watcher saw over five hours a week of TV with ads enticing viewers to buy goods that would improve their lives. According to one ad man, TV was a man-eating tiger, and with one commercial on television, sales would go through the roof. To sell their products, advertisers used images that resonated with the public, ones that conveyed youth, sophistication, and modernity, as well as the image of the ideal American family enjoying the fruits of a prosperous nation. Automobile companies emphasized their modern styles, complete with rocket-like fins, and linked the car to the idealized family that saw, saw the USA in their Chevrolet. The public responded enthusiastically, trading in out-of-date but still very operable cars for the newest models. Gone were the depression and war mottos of use it up and wear it out. Now consumerism is in. Increasingly, to pay for cars, TVs, washing machines, toys, and mom's night out, Americans turned to credit, and a new form of credit was available, the all-purpose credit card. The Diners Club card, uh, credit card made its debut in 1950, followed by American Express and a host of other plastic cards. By 1958, credit purchases reached $44 billion, more than five times the amount bought on credit in 1946. Working wives and rocking kids. 
Unlike the families shown on TV, life in the suburbs was not, was not always idyllic or equal to expectations. Togetherness was more often seen on television than in real life. Studies found that more than one-fifth of suburban wives were unhappy with their marriages and lives. Many women complained of the drudgery and boredom of housework and a lack of understanding and affection from their husbands. Responding to personal motives or economic needs, more married middle-class women were working outside the home, even those with young children. While some sought self-fulfillment in careers, others worked to safeguard their families' existing standard of living. Most found part-time jobs or sales clerk or clerical positions that paid low wages and provided few benefits. Look Magazine in a 1956 article pointed out, about a, pointed out that about a third of the workforce were women, usually seeking to fill their hope chest or to buy a new home freezer and happily conceding the top job rungs to men. Whether they conceded gracefully or not, in the banking sector, women made up 46% of the workforce but held only 15% of upper level positions. Like their mothers, children did not always match the image of the ideal family and juvenile delinquency became a serious concern for parents and society. Juvenile crime among gangs operating in cities was not new, but in the, as the 1950s progressed, many in the middle-class suburbs were alarmed about the behavior of their own teens who seemed to flout traditional values and behavior. At the center of the problem, many believed was the public high school where middle-class kids mixed with children of the other America. The children of working class whites, Latinos, and African-Americans were attending high school in larger numbers and were thought to be a bad influence. Their clothing choices, t-shirts, jeans, leather jackets, their disrespect for authority, and their music conflicted with middle-class norms. Adding to the problem, experts said, were improper family environments where lax parenting and improper gender roles led to confused children and juvenile delinquents. For example, the film Rebel Without a Cause with teen idol James Dean, the rebellious young characters come from suburban homes where gender roles are reversed, with dominating mothers and fathers who cook and assume many traditional housewifely duties. The problem with kids also seemed connected to cars and rock and roll. The availability of the car allowed teens to escape adult controls and provided a private lounge for drinking and sex episodes. Rock and roll, the term coined by Alan Freed, was a new American music genre that broke barriers between black music and white music. Critics argued that it undermined American morals and was a tool of communism. A Catholic youth center newspaper asked readers to smash rock and roll records because they promoted a pagan concept of life, but it was a losing battle. By mid-decade, African-American artists like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and Ray Charles were successfully crossing over and being heard on white radio stations, while white singers copied and modified R&B songs to produce cover records. Cover artists like Pat Boone sold millions of records that avoided suggestive lyrics and were heard on hundreds of radio stations that refused to play the original versions by Black artists. At the same time, some white singers, including the 1950s most dynamic star Elvis Presley, were making their own contributions. Beginning with Heartbreak Hotel in 1956, Presley recorded 14 gold records within two years. In concerts, he drove his audiences into frenzies with sexually suggestive movements that earned him the nickname Elvis the Pelvis. Less controversial, Dick Clark's American Bandstand, a weekly television show featuring teens dancing to rock and roll, was by the end of the decade one of the nation's most watched and most accepted programs. Rejecting consensus. Rock and roll became accepted by the end of the decade, but homosexuality was a whole other matter. Alfred Kinsey's studies of sexuality found that a sizable number of gays and lesbians lived closeted lives throughout the U.S. and that an increasingly open gay subculture was uh, centered in major cities. In a society that emphasized the traditional family and feared internal subversion, homosexuals represented behavior that could not be condemned. Some argued that homosexuality was a psychological illness, but most considered it a crime that's subject to legal prosecution. Vice squads frequently raided gay and lesbian bars, and newspapers often listed the names, addresses, and employers of those arrested. A Senate investigating committee concluded that because of a lack of moral fiber, one homosexual could pollute a government office. Within the government, homosexuals were barred from military service in most government jobs. In response to the attacks, many took extra efforts to hide their homosexuality, but some organized to confront the prejudice. Henry Hay formed the Mattachin Society in 1951 to fight for homosexual rights, and in 1955, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon organized a similar organization for lesbians, the Daughters of Belitis. It's worth noting, too, that there's the Lavender Scare during the 1950s with Eisenhower in office. During the Lavender Scare, there are no protections for um, gays or lesbians in the federal government, and so being fired for that identity or that behavior um, there, there was no um, legal recourse. So if you were fired because you were gay, you couldn't you know, appeal to try to keep your job. It was a, a time of, um, of consensus in many ways. And it was a time of uh, a fear of being different. And the lavender scare represents a lot of that. Also viewed as extreme are the Beats or Beatniks, a group that rejected the morality and lifestyles of mainstream American culture. Allen Ginsberg in his poem Howl, 1956, and Jack Kerouac in his novel On the Road, 1957, denounced American materialism and sexual repression and glorified a freer, natural life. 
if you have a minute, you might Google Allen, Allen Ginsberg Howell or his poem, America. A minority, especially among young college students, found the beatnik critique of square America meaningful, but most Americans easily rejected the beat's message and lifestyles. Americans could justify the suppression of beatniks and homosexuals because they appeared to mock traditional values of family and community. Other critics of American society, however, were more difficult to dismiss. Several respected writers and intellectuals claimed that suburban and consumer culture was destructive, stifling diversity and individuality in favor of conformity. Mass-produced homes, meals, toys, fashions, and other trappings of suburban life, they said, created a gray sameness about the Americans. Sociologist David Reisman argued in The Lonely Crowd that post-war Americans, unlike earlier generations, were outer-directed, less sure of their values and morals, and overly concerned about fitting into a group. Peer pressure, he suggested, had replaced individual thinking. William H. White's controversial organization man echoed Reisman's concerns and found that working as a team had surpassed self-reliance as a trait of American workers. Both urged readers to resist being packaged like cake mixes and to reassert their own identities. In another vein, Holden Caulfield, the hero of J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, unable to find his place in society, merely concluded that the major features of American life were all phony. Outside suburbia. The average American depicted in, by Reader's Digest was a white middle-class suburbanite. This portrait excluded a large part of the population, though, especially minorities and the poor. Although the percentage of those living below the poverty line set during the 1950s at around $3,000 a year was declining, it was still over 22% and included large percentages of the elderly, minorities, and women heads of household. Even with social security payments, as 1959 ended, uh, nearly 31% of those over age 65 lived below the poverty line, with 8 million receiving less than $1,000 a year. Women heads of household contributed another 23% of those living in poverty, while throughout rural America, especially among small farmers and farm workers, poverty was common. In rural Mississippi, the annual per capita income was less than $900. Poverty also increased in major cities as Blacks and Latinos continued to migrate there. By 1960, half of all African Americans and nearly 80% of Latinos lived in urban centers where non-white unemployment commonly reached 40%. New York's Puerto Rican community, for example, increased more than 1,000%, while in cities like Atlanta and Washington, D.C., African Americans became the majority. Yet, despite their growing numbers, minorities rarely exercised any political power. At the same time, most cities were less able to provide needed services because of lost tax revenues as white middle and working class families moved into the suburbs and were followed by many businesses, talking about white flight there. When funds were available for urban renewal and development, many city governments like Miami and Los Angeles used those funds to relocate and isolate minorities and specific neighborhoods away from entertainment and upscale shopping and residential areas. The Civil Rights Movement, considering the two questions, how did African Americans attack de jour segregation in American society during the 1950s? And what role did the federal government play in promoting civil rights? For many African Americans, poverty was just one fa facet of life. They also faced a legally sanctioned segregated society. Legal or de jure segregation existed not only in the South, but also in the District of Columbia and several Western and Midwestern states. De jure segregation exists in opposition to de facto segregation. De facto segregation is when it's not a legal practice, but it's simply a custom of the particular area. Changes had occurred, but most African Americans regarded them as minor victories, indicating no real shift in white America's racial views. By 1952, the NAACP had won cases permitting African Americans, uh, law and graduate students to attend white colleges and universities, even though the, uh, the separate but equal ruling established in 1896 by the Supreme Court in Plessy v. Ferguson remained intact. As the decade progressed, efforts against segregation intensified, but assistance from the federal government was slow in coming. Integrating schools. A step toward more significant integration in, in education came in 1954 when the Supreme Court considered the case of Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. The Brown case had started four years earlier when Oliver Brown sued to force the school district to allow his daughter to attend a nearby white school. The Kansas courts had rejected his suit, pointing out that the availability of job for African Americans, or excuse me, of a school for African Americans fulfilled the Supreme Court's separate but equal ruling. The NAACP appealed. In addressing the Supreme Court, NAACP lawyer Thurgood Marshall argued that the concept of separate, separate but equal was inherently self-contradictory. He used statistics to show that black schools were unequal in financial resources and the quality and number of teachers. He also used a psychological study, the Clark Dahl test, indicating that Black children educated in a segregated environment suffered from low self-esteem. Marshall stressed that segregated educational facilities, even if they were physically similar, could never yield equal results. The very fact of separation was unconstitutional, regardless of whether the facilities were equal or not. In 1952, a divided court was unable to make a decision, but two years later, the court heard the case again. Now sitting as Chief Justice was Earl Warren. The Republican former governor of California who had been appointed by the court by uh, to the court by Eisenhower in 1953. 
To the dismay of many who had considered Warren a legal conservative, the Chief Justice and the court rejected social and political consensus and unanimously stated that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Recognizing the degree of change in the Brown decision wrought, in 1955, the court addressed how to implement the ruling and gave primary responsibility to local school boards, ordering them to proceed with, quote, all deliberate speed. The justices also instructed lower federal courts to monitor progress according to this vague guideline. Reactions to this case were predictable. African Americans and liberals hailed the decision and hoped that segregated schools would soon be an institution of the past. Southern whites vowed to resist integration by all possible means. Virginia passed a law uh, closing any integrated school. Southern congressional representatives issued the Southern Manifesto in which they proudly pledged to oppose the Brown ruling. Eisenhower, who thought the court had erred, refused to support the decision publicly. While both political parties carefully danced around school integration and other civil rights uh, issues, the school district in Little Rock, Arkansas, moved forward with all deliberate speed. And I do want to skip back real fast and read It Matters Today, the Brown decision. The Brown versus Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court remains a milestone in American history. It is doubtful that any child may reasonably be, reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity, the court wrote, is a right which must be made available to all in equal terms. The ruling raised expectations that it desegregated public schools, but it also fell short of expectations. It did not provide for effective integration or quality of education. Other cases have since tested the definitions of equality and the methods used to achieve racial diversity. Until the late 70s, the court's decisions upheld using race as a determining factor to achieve diversity. However, since then, several of the court's decisions have indicated that the use of race has discriminated against Caucasians, a reverse discrimination. Is there a way, one justice recently asked, to decide when the use of race to achieve diversity is benign or discriminatory? Some argue that the Supreme Court should apply colorblind criteria when deciding if institutions and businesses can use race to create diversity. How does this view reflect the view of the original Brown decision? Research the issues behind the December 2006 Supreme Court cases involving the Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Missouri school districts. Compare the issues to the decisions made by the court on the issue in June of 2007. Going back to it, the school district in Little Rock, Arkansas, moved forward with all deliberate speed. Central High School was scheduled to integrate in 1957. Opposing integration were the parents of the school's students and Governor Orville Favis, who ordered National Guard troops to surround the school and prevent desegregation. When Elizabeth Eckford, one of the nine integrating students, walked toward Central High, National Guardsmen blocked her path as a hostile mob roared, roared lynch her, lynch her. Spat on by the jeering crowd, she retreated to her bus stop, and Central High remained segregated. For three weeks, the Black students were prevented from enrolling. Then on September 20th, a federal judge ordered the integration of Central High School. Faubus complied and withdrew the National Guard, but segregationists remained determined to block integration, and on Monday, September 23rd, 1957, when they discovered that the nine had slipped into the school unnoticed, they rushed the police lines and battered the school doors open. Inside the school, Melba Patella Beals thought, I'm going to die here in school. Hurriedly, the students were loaded into cars and warned to duck their heads. School officials ordered the drivers to start driving, do not stop. If you hit somebody, you keep rolling, because if you stop, the kids are dead. Integration had lasted almost three hours and was followed by rioting throughout the city, forcing the mayor to ask for federal troops to restore order. Faced with insurrection, Eisenhower on September 24th nationalized the Arkansas National Guard and dispatched 1,000 troops of the 101st Airborne Division to Little Rock. Speaking to the nation, the president emphasized that he had sent the federal troops not to integrate the schools, but to uphold the law and to restore order. The distinction was lost on most white Southerners who, found, who fumed as soldiers protected the nine Black students for the rest of the school year. Even with the presence of the soldiers, threats against the nine students continued. Beals remembered that there was no word big enough to explain her fear, fear that any day she could be killed. The following school year, 1957-8, the city closed its high schools rather than integrate them. That's how strong the anti-integration sentiment is. They would rather close their schools than have them be integrated. To prevent, prevent such actions, the Supreme Court ruled in Cooper v. Era in 1959 that an African American's right to attend schools could not be nullified openly or by evasive schemes for segregation. Little Rock's high schools reopened and integration slowly spread to the lower grades. But in Little Rock, as in other communities, many white families fled the integrated public schools and enrolled their children in private schools that were beyond the reach of the federal courts. With no endorsement from the White House and entrenched Southern opposition, all deliberate speed amounted to a snail's pace. By 1965, less than 2% of all Southern schools were integrated. The Montgomery Bus Boycott. While the nation responded to the Brown decision, other events involving civil rights grabbed national headlines, including the death of Emmett Till and the Montgomery Bus Boycott. 
1955, Till, an African-American teenager from Chicago, visited relatives in Mississippi and was brutally tortured and murdered for speaking to a white woman without her permission. In the trial that followed, the two murderers were acquitted. It was not an unexpected verdict in Mississippi, but it and the brutality of the murder shocked much of the nation. That shock increased when, listen carefully here, the murderers sold their story to the Look magazine for $4,000 and admitted that even after they had beaten Till, uh, Till he still talked back. I listened, said J.W. Milan, to that uh, inward, throw that poison at me, and I just made up my mind. Chicago boy, I said, I'm tired of him sending your kind down here to stir up trouble. I'm going to make an example of you just so everyone can know how me and my folks stand. To be very clear, they admitted in Look Magazine to the murder, and they're not brought to justice for it because of double jeopardy. They're not punished. And later on, the woman who alleged that he had, um, that Emmett Till had whistled at her and talked to her, towards the end of her life, she came out and said that she's not entirely sure any of that actually happened in the first place. Later in 1955, on December 1st in Montgomery, Alabama, Rosa Parks set a different kind of example when she refused to give up her seat on a city bus so that a white man could sit. At 42, Mrs. Parks earned $23 a week as a seamstress, and she had not boarded the bus with the intention of disobeying the seating law, although she strongly opposed it. But that afternoon, her fatigue and humiliation were suddenly too much, and she refused to move and was arrested. She's also well-trained in uh, nonviolent resistance. For example, she's a graduate of the Highlander Folk School, and this is not all just because she's tired. There's a deliberate plan that will be put in motion here very quickly after she refuses to give up her seat. Hearing of her arrest, local African-American community leaders saw an opportunity to contest segregation. They petitioned the city and the bus company to consider a more equitable bus seating system, and when both refused, they called for a boycott of the bus line. On December 5th, 1955, the night before the boycott, nearly 4,000 people filled and surrounded Holt Street Baptist Church to hear Martin Luther King Jr., the newly selected leader of the boycott movement, now called the Montgomery Improvement Association. King firmly believed that the church had a social justice mission and that violence and hatred, even when considered justified, brought only ruin. In shaping that evening's speech, he wrestled with the problem of how to balance disobedience with peace, confrontation with civility, and rebellion with tradition. And his words overcame the contradictions, electrifying the crowd. We are here this evening to say that to those who have mistreated us so long that we are tired of being segregated and humiliated, tired of being kicked about by the brutal feet of oppression. King asked the crowd to boycott the buses, to protest courageously and yet with dignity and Christian love, and when confronted with violence, to bless them that curse you. On December 6th, Rosa Parks was tried, found guilty, and fined $10 plus $4 for court costs. And you can see some images of her and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. there on page 713. Those might be interesting to you. She appealed, sorry, and the boycott, 90% effective, stretched into days, weeks, and finally months. Police issued basketfuls of traffic tickets to drivers taking part in the carpools that provided transportation for boycotters. Insurance companies canceled their automobile coverage and acid was poured on their ears or on their cars. Oh my gosh, on their cars, not on their ears. On January 30th, 1956, somebody threw a stick of dynamite that destroyed King's front porch, almost injuring King's wife and a friend. King remained calm, reminding supporters to avoid violence and persevere. Finally, as the boycott approached its first anniversary, the Supreme Court ruled in Gale et al. v. Browser uh, that the city's and bus company's policy of segregation was unconstitutional. Praise the Lord, God has spoken from Washington, D.C., cried one boycotter. The Montgomery bus boycott shattered the traditional white view that African Americans accepted segregation, and it marked the beginning of a pattern of nonviolent resistance. Across the South, thousands of African Americans were eager to take, it to, the, to, take to the streets and to use the federal courts to achieve equality. Building on the energy generated by the boycott, in 1956, King and other Black leaders formed a new civil rights organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, which you definitely need to know about. Toward a more perfect union, desegregation in the Supreme Court. Since the end of Reconstruction, African Americans and organizations like the NAACP have used the courts to fight segregation, but with few victories until the mid-1950s. Then the Warren Court in the Brown 1954 and Cooper 1958 decisions utilized the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to strike down segregation in public schools. These decisions provided a basis on which lower level federal courts began to dismantle discrimination and segregationist policies by public service companies and state and local governments. Reflecting the Brown decision, the federal Fourth Circuit Court concluded in Gale v. Browder 1956 that the separate but equal doctrine can no longer be safely followed as a correct statement of the law. There is now no rational basis upon which the separate but equal doctrine can be validly applied. I can civil rights. As the civil rights movement continued, the White House responded with carefully selected platitudes. When asked, Eisenhower gave elusive replies. I plead for understanding, for really sympathetic consideration of a problem. I am for moderation, but I am for progress. That is exactly what I am for in this thing. Personally, Eisenhower believed that government, especially the executive branch, had little role in integration. Max Schraub, his advisor on minority affairs, thought that 
quote, the Negroes were being too, too aggressive. On a political level, cabinet members in Eisenhower were disappointed in the low number of Blacks who had voted Republican in 1952 and 1956. But not all within the administration were unsympathetic towards civil rights. Attorney General Herbert Brownell drafted the first civil rights legis legislation since Reconstruction. The Civil Rights Act of 1957 passed Congress after a year of political maneuvering, having gained the support of Democratic Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas. A moderate law, it provided for the formation of a commission on civil rights and opened the possibility of using federal lawsuits to ensure voter rights. A second act passed Congress in 1960 that strengthened efforts to use the courts to gain voting rights, but like its predecessor, it was too weak to counter white opposition and violence in the South. Pageant Magazine examines rock and roll Alan Freed, uh, July 1957, we're hearing the individual voices feature. Controversy has always surrounded rock and roll. Critics called it jungle music, cannibalistic and tribal, rife with lyrics, sexual terms and innuendos, and worst of all, a communicable disease. But less alarmist views also existed, as in this excerpt by Theodore Irwin and Pageant, a popular monthly magazine that mixed common interest stories with photo features. Getting upset over teenage behavior has become a national pastime. A noisy crowd is just a crowd, unless it's composed of adolescents, and then it's labeled a riot. When youngsters get into trouble, adults have pointed an accusing finger at the new corrupter of youth, that awful music, rock and roll. Apparently, rock and roll has no charms to soothe the savage beast. Over-exhilarated teenagers have screeched and screamed, smashed windows, thrown beer bottles, wrecked, bottles, wrecked theaters, and produced blaring headlines. Elders have fumed, pontificated, and legislated against the craze. Rock and roll has been banned in some public places. Eminent psychologists, sociologists, and psychiatrists have characterized rock and roll as everything from adolescent rebellion to a medieval type of spontaneous lunacy. Yet millions of youngsters virtually live by rock and roll and every day more and more are becoming exponents. Devotees will tell you that disapproving middle-aged people, anyone over 25, are hopeless squares and condemn what they don't understand. We're having some fun before we get too old to enjoy ourselves, said one 15-year-old girl. Is rock and roll harmless or dangerous? Any serious investigation inevitably, inevitably runs smack into Alan Freed. He coined the phrase and he is the acknowledged priest of the rock and roll cult and evangelist of the teenagers' big beat. Rock and roll is kids, he says. The music belongs to them. They had a need for it and they discovered it. Teenagers believe in me, he explains, because they know I'm their friend and give them the music that they want. Virtually overnight, the super salesman had parlayed rock and roll to $200,000 a year income. His program reaches 12 states. On tape, he's heard in Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, and over. Radio Luxembourg throughout Europe and England. On the side, he writes songs and is a partner in a record company. In this business, he says, candidly, your career is so short, you've got to get it from all angles. What is the future of rock and roll? I think, says Freed, it will settle itself into the mainstream of American popular music. In fact, it is starting to right now. I expect in about 10 years, my band will be playing at the Waldorf Astoria. Summary. Had enough, Republicans asked voters in 1952. Voters responded by electing Eisenhower. The promising change, Eisenhower chose foreign and domestic policies that continued the, ba the basic patterns established by Truman. Republicans reduced some domestic programs, but there was no large-scale dismantling of the New Deal. In foreign policy, the new look relied on new tactics, but Eisenhower continued the policy of containment, expanding American influence in Southern Asia and the Middle East. Although the Soviets uh, spoke of peaceful coexistence, relations with the Soviet Union deteriorated during the, de the decade, and Moscow seemed to score victories with Sputnik and in Cuba. The 1950s spawned comforting images of American prosperity with affluent suburbs and a growing consumer culture. Yet the reality of the 1950s did not always match the image. Many people behaved contrary to the supposed norms of family and suburban culture. An increasing number of married women worked while young adults embraced rock and roll and other forms of expression that seemed to reject established norms and values. Others believed that America's middle-class culture bred too much conformity and stifled individualism. Outside the suburbs, another America existed where economic realities, social prejudices, and entrenched politics blocked equality and upward mobility. In the South, a grassroots civil rights movement emerged to contest decades of segregation. By the end of the decade, long established patterns of segregation were declared illegal by federal courts and civil rights had emerged as an issue that neither political party nor white America could ignore any longer. 